ever wonder how a groundbreaking, pioneering, and award-winning chef and cookbook author came to such a place? Today, we'll find out from Deborah Madison. Welcome to the Leading Voices in Food podcast. I'm Kelly Brownell, Director of the World Food Policy Center at Duke University. After working at Breakthrough Restaurants, Chez Panisse in Berkeley and Greens in San Francisco, Deborah Madison made her mark in Rome, opened Cafe Escalera in Santa Fe, and became a prolific writer of cookbooks and other items about food for places like Gourmet Magazine and Food and Wine. Her latest book, which is entitled An Onion in My Pocket, is a memoir. It has been very positively reviewed in many places with terms like beguiling, honest and captivating. And in the words of Marian Nessel, a well-known figure in the food area, the book shows how the path that carried Deborah to become what Marian said is the consummate vegetarian cook and cookbook writer. So Deborah, thanks so much for joining us. I'm delighted to have you with us today. Well, thank you, Kelly. I'm delighted to be here. So your book, An Onion in My Pocket, has a really intriguing title. How did you come to that? Well, there was an onion in my pocket one day, and I just was writing about it, maybe telling my editor about it. And she said, oh, we should use that for the title. There was an onion in my pocket because I had been cooking with a friend, and these onions were left over from a pizza we were making. They were beautiful onions, and I took it home with me. And then I went to Spanish class, and it was in my pocket along with my pencils and papers and things like that. And I took it out, put it on the desk, and people started to laugh. And I thought, to me, it's normal. Of course, I have an onion in my pocket, or I could have anything in my pocket. I've even had a snake in my purse that I brought home once because it was going to eat gophers, which I really appreciate. So that's how that came about. Wow, all kinds of interesting things show up in your pocket in your purse. Well, that's a very <laughs> interesting story. So in your book, you write about some of your other 14 cookbooks and what was involved in writing and publishing them. Which ones mean the most to you? Well, I think Local Flavors does, Seasonal Fruit Desserts, and above all, Vegetable Literacy. And they, they mean something to me because actually the first chant that we learned at Tassajara, which is the Zen monastery I was at, was 72 labors brought us this food. We should know how it comes to us. And all these books are indirectly about how food comes to us and the stories of food. And they're interesting to me. And I'm still very interested in that question. So those are my favorites. So Deborah, you mentioned something that I find fascinating about the story of food. Does it seem to you like it does to me that more and more people are becoming interested in the story of their food? And do you think this is a positive trend? Well, I feel like it's both positive and not so positive. I hope we're not going to lose what we've gained in variety, particularly of vegetables, because it's been a long, long fight. You know, I mean, 40 years ago, there was nothing there was really nothing to eat, and now there's a lot, and yet people are going back to old things as vegetables become harder and harder to get. I've even cooked corn dogs for my husband who requested them, and I thought, oh, really? I've never even had a corn dog. What is a corn dog? I had to go online to learn how to make one. I think that there's kind of a retrograde happening right now in the pandemic. At the same time, I, I think that people are interested in the story of their food, and they have to be because it's disappearing. You know, as I look out there and I see more and more restaurants have a board on the wall that lists the farmers where the food comes from. And you hear people talk about food miles or the environmental impact of the foods they're purchasing or consuming. And, you know, people are interested in animal welfare or others are interested in some other issue of this. But when you put it all together, it seems to me that the number of people who care about these things has gone way up. And that I at least see that as a very positive trend, but I appreciate your thoughts on that. Oh, I think it's a positive trend too, and I, I like it. And I, I hope people really do what they say. For here in New Mexico, people would say, oh, we use local food and they'd order a pound of lettuce or something like that, and it would run out. But I think people are doing more. You can taste the difference. You can see the difference. Customers aren't stupid, you know, especially if they shop at farmer's markets. They're, they're familiar. And if they have gardens, and I think more and more people are gardening, at least judging by the seeds and how they're disappearing from companies who take breaks and fulfilling orders and that kind of thing. But I think you're right. I think there is more of a concern than there has been in the past. So you write about what you call kitchen lessons. 
things that you've learned often from customers. Can you share some examples? The one I was really interested in was don't apologize. The example I used in the book was with a customer who said he loved the smoky flavor in the mushroom soup we had made. Now, I knew there wasn't supposed to be a smoky flavor, so I just said thank you very much. (laughs) Because why make him feel terrible about misjudging or not recognizing that the solids had fallen to the bottom of the pot and were scorched and that that's what he was tasting? So that was a lesson that I did learn very much from customers. Other lessons I knew were, I learned were to one, eat in the dining room like a customer is very, very important as a way to getting to know your food. Treat everybody the same, for sure. You have to do that. And and I mean, I learned these lessons in the most painful ways possible. Marion Cunningham taught us a really good lesson when she said, Debbie, dear, do you not believe in salt? And then she talked about salting food and how you should salt as you go and you cook. Let's see. Be gracious always to everybody. You know, people would come into the kitchen and tell me that that was the best meal they'd had. And I'd want to say, you're kidding. What do you eat normally? You know, but I finally had to learn that their experience was very different from mine and that it was just important to say, I'm so glad you enjoyed it and actually mean it. And the last lesson wasn't so much a lesson, but a hint of things to come, which was know that the six months in the beginning will be the hardest, but you will get to leave one day. And that did happen almost to the day. And I was reflecting upon that and thinking at the time, oh, six months have gone by. I've made it. We've made it. And now Greens is over 40 years old. It's amazing. (laughs) Let's talk about that a little bit. So if you think back to those days when you worked at places like Greens and Chez Panisse, how are those or similar restaurants different today than they were back then? Certainly they're more popular and visible, but beyond that, have things changed much within the restaurants? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they have, um, especially Chez Panisse, because I never, ever could walk in and get a job like I did then. I mean, I just wanted to work there so badly, and it made so much sense to me. That food made so much sense to me. And I don't think I would have been able to do that today, for sure. Alice isn't there so much like she was then, and it wasn't so new. Greens, for one, is the dinners are a la carte menus. They're much more expensive. They're beautiful. The menus are are printed on heavy paper stock. The waiters know the difference between espresso and expresso, which we didn't really understand so much then. We thought that coffee drink was to get you going, and it is, but it's not an express. It's espresso, it's press, things like that. So I think they are different, but I think in some ways they're the same. Their commitments are the same. There are just many more restaurants that are doing that kind of thing, too. As I scan the titles of your books, nine of them mention vegetables in the title. But you say you're not a vegetarian. Why is that? Well, I just find it's too limiting. It's it's just too limiting. I think I, I'm probably a natural vegetarian and that that's the food I really love to cook and eat. But if we are a nation of meat eaters, and I really think we are, I feel it's important to, to know what that's about. And that's why I've been on the board of the Southwest Grass-Fed Livestock Alliance twice. And if somebody I know, like my husband, for example, wants meat and he was raised with meat, I, I'm happy to cook it for him. I I don't like the limits of vegetarianism or any kind of food title. I don't really care to have a label attached to what I eat. So given that you're so prominent in writing books for people who are vegetarian, do you get any pushback yourself for the fact that you're not strictly vegetarian yourself? That's the strange thing is I don't. I have never gotten pushback. Maybe people are horrified. I don't know. But in my book, Local Flavors, I actually did have 11 recipes that were for meat because meat was appearing in the market. And this was about the farmer's market movement across the United States. Nobody seemed to notice. Nobody commented. I don't know. It's it's odd. I haven't gotten pushback. On the contrary, I feel that people are sort of relieved with this book in a way that I'm not super strict about anything. I'm just not. I I have a hard time being strict, (laughs) except about the vegetables I eat. I want high quality. So what do you really think matters about food? And and how do you define the concept of nourishment? Well, 
food that's cooked with a mind of kindness and generosity, care, thoughtfulness, maybe even simplicity. I think that that's what's important. It's much more important than what is on the plate, whether there's meat or not. And I actually did end the book with a lot of stories about meals I remembered. And some of them had meat, some of them didn't. But the point was is that they were so generously given and prepared for me that I remembered them. Some of them happened quite a long time ago. You know, it's fascinating to hear you use words like generosity and kindness and describing how food can be given and received. How does that come through in the way, say, a restaurant can provide food to people or how families can do it? Because it sounds like that's very important. Well, it, it is. And I've always found that to be true at Chez Panisse. I love for example, when people come into a restaurant, they're welcomed, you know, with kindness, with, hello, can I help you? And, oh, you have a reservation, what time? And please follow me. And there's bread on the table or olives or something good. And that's a kind of food kindness that can be extended to strangers. I was writing in my book about more personal kinds of kindness, but not always. In fact, the first story I tell was a meal in Scotland that I had, and it really pointed me to my North Star, which was about how food in season and in its place is the best food yeah. always. And, you know, that was because a woman agreed to feed this older woman that I was traveling with and myself. And we were really, really hungry. And we sat and waited and we looked at the garden and we looked at a lake. And pretty soon she came in with a platter with the vegetables from the garden and fish from the lake. It was beautiful. It was really quite stunning. Well, it's really wonderful to hear you talk about food in human terms, that, you know, it's more than just nutrition, it's more than nourishment, and it's, it's more than what precedes eating and all the environmental factors and the like, but that it really can form a type of human kindness. So it's really wonderful to hear your perspective on that. And I just want to thank you so much for joining us today. You had some amazing things to say. And your book, An Onion in My Pocket, I'm sure will thrill lots of people to hear your journey about how you got to the point you are now today. So thank you again for being with us. Well, thank you very much. So our guest today is Deborah Madison, an American chef, food writer, and cooking teacher. Her latest book, as I mentioned, is titled An Onion in My Pocket. And thank you for listening. If you would like to subscribe to the Leading Voices in Food podcast series, you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or your favorite podcast app. Podcasts and transcripts are also available on the website of the Duke World Food Policy Center. This is Kelly Brownell. <music>